Earlier in this class, we read an article by Jared Diamond from 1987 called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race, which is pretty, pretty polemical, pretty, pretty hard hitting. And it basically claimed, as you remember, that agriculture was the biggest, the worst, and most terrible thing that's ever happened to us. Ten years later, he came out with a very giant book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of Human Societies. Look at how big that is. It's a big book. And although some of the themes about agriculture and its negative issues were still around, for the most part, as we saw in the film version of this, agriculture became the explanation for why Eurasian and especially European peoples had come to dominate uh, the world during the colonial period. And so although the title is Guns, Germs, and Steel, if you read carefully into each of his chapters, each of those things goes back to early adoption of agriculture and domestication of animals, and that's what gave the Europeans an advantage. So it's actually a fairly easy book to read in that he always starts out with a fun story, but in the end, it's all agriculture. That's what caused this kind of thing. And for that, gets to sell lots of copies, win the Pulitzer Prize. A few years later, I don't know, five or so years later, 10, came out with another book. Not quite as big, didn't make such a splash. Guns, Germs, and Steel is still the his leading thing. But this book was called Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. So you notice the first one was The Fates of Human Societies, which was basically about how agriculture was determining of the fates of human societies and, and there weren't many choices involved. Whereas Collapse is about choosing to fail or succeed. And there's the poor Maya there, I think. Somebody who built the pyramids and they're all gone. They're in black and white. So these books became, especially Guns, Germs, and Steel, became very popular. And they became part of many of, even two of you at least, at least two of you in this very class have told me that you had to read at least parts of Guns, Germs, and Steel during your high school education. So these books became, have become kind of the narrative uh, or the story for what happened in our, in our recent past and the explanation for European colonialism. So we've watched some things. We've been in some ways kind of circling around uh, around these ideas. Um, but today we read an article by Michael Wilcox called Marketing Conquest and the Vanishing Indian. Nicole, if you had to say what this article is about in one, what's he trying to do here? What's his goal? Who's he taking on? <laughs> The other guy, yeah. Yeah, if you had to be, you know, what is he doing? He's like, what happened? And in part, this is a reaction because Jared Diamond is actually in his old life an ornithologist. He studied birds and gallbladders in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. And so a lot of people think that he's done archeological research or become an anthropologist or is hanging out with people in the Kalahari he's none of those things and that's not bad it's not that everybody has to be an archaeologist in order to write about archaeology but what Wilcox is sort of saying is how did this idea how did this narrative about history become so embedded in our textbooks and so that when people come to college they've already got this idea in their head so that's really kind of the the, the main thrust of it an indigenous response to Jared Diamond's guns germs and steel and collapse I want to make, um, I want to talk about, I'm going to make this, this article is a little bit long. It's a little bit complicated. 
it's got some pictures, some graphs, it's got some good archaeology in there. But I want to talk about seven sort of main big points that he's making here about what's, what's going on in the world. The first big point is that indigenous peoples, well, Native Americans, didn't just go away in 1492. So this is actually a picture that I got from an archive uh, around the year 1900. The subtitle is Pima Men Building a Dam, which there they are, the Pima Men. Of course, what do we know, Tyler, where'd Tyler go? What do we know about the Pima Men? <laughs> Yeah, it's like calling a whole people the huh, who, <laughs> right? So yeah, it's a, it's a strange irony of history. Now, some people take up these names, just like the we talked about the word, uh, the term Indian, which is also a misnomer, has been appropriated by some people. And so this is, you know, sometimes those names are taken up, even though they weren't originally given to people in their uh, they didn't want them at first. But here's, uh, again, a picture of what happened about 100 years ago, or, you know, this is in 1900 when they're, there they are, still digging a canal. And this leads us to our second big point is that indigenous people or Native Americans are here, existing, alive. Here's a picture from 2008 of they were talking about these canals and the recuperations of some of these indigenous um, agricultural patterns, uh, old techniques that have helped people in the Southwest to survive long periods of drought. Uh, before there was, we were draining out the Colorado River and all that stuff. There were old techniques to be able to uh, pollinate the land and survive uh, harsh conditions and to still have these kinds of uh, uh, agricultural stuff going on, even in an environment which may not seem to be completely suited for it. So uh, first couple points, Native Americans didn't disappear and they're still here. Part of this I think has to do with the way in which I feel like in the Northeast, especially my kids learn American history. It's like there's about three pages about the Native Americans and the Paleo Indians. And then they start talking about the 13 colonies and you see a map like this, where the rest of the United States is kind of grayed in and already with its state outlines as if it's kind of just waiting there to be, you know, turned into states as if we were always destined to have Texas, but there we just started out here and we're going to get there eventually. And so it doesn't, what we don't learn is when we're learning about the history of the 13 colonies, we don't learn what's actually going on at the same time in places like Arizona, well, what would be Arizona or New Mexico. I wonder how they got that name from. Uh, so, you know, we don't learn about what is going on. We just learn that these are places where we're, we're eventually going to get to is basically, is basically what, how most of our, most of our history textbooks in, in the early years work. So, you know, we see pictures of, there's some Native Americans doing their Native American thing. We see pictures like this. I got this from the Arizona tourism website. So you might see people like that. So fourth point, no, third point. Jack, what happened here? Why did these canals dry up? Hugely important point. It's a little bit, some of his writing is a little bit confusing. So let's just make it very clear that when farmers came in from other places, they basically diverted the water that was going downstream and that they were using 
And they went to court and they tried to say, hey, wait a second, this is our water. And it didn't work. They lost those court battles. And so originally when people started moving in, they actually got help from people who were indigenous to the area. The people helped the US Army and traded with them. But eventually that relationship would turn sour and pretty, pretty late in the game, this is the 1850s. And so then after that, we find that a lot of these places get in some ways abandoned or don't look so great. Nick, what happens to these? Uh, what happens after these places? What do the archaeologists do? Well, they thought it was an entirely new ethnic group. Yeah, they come in and they're like, hey, got some archaeological evidence here. And um, Wilcox is basically like, look, the Hohokam, which are actually, would be probably the if, if they're the people who were the ancestors of the actual Odom, the, the, the RSS idea, and if you click on this link for the Arizona, if you want to have the Arizona experience, it says that there are these people, the Hohokam, who, who disappeared in 1453, which is a very convenient time to disappear in 1453. You know, you just come and go. I'm not trying to say that people didn't come and go. Of course, empires rose and fell throughout the Americas as well as throughout Eurasia and Africa. So people did come and go and empires had different fates. And, but the idea that people in some ways were all gone by the time the Europeans arrived is convenient. <laughs> it's a convenient story. So Wilcox then trains his energy back upon Jared Diamond. And what he's trying to say is the reason he's, again, critical of him is not necessarily um, that he thinks he's completely factually incorrect, although there's plenty of that, but it's because that these narratives have become so deeply embedded in our ideas about what happened. And so what he's saying is that the problem is, is that in his Guns, Germs, and Steel book, every, the conquest is like, oh, didn't mean to, or, oh, we were resistant to germs, you weren't, so sorry. Um, you know, it's kind of this idea that, 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 there, that what happened in the Americas was the result of geographic fate, the adoption of agriculture. On the other hand, and perhaps this might make somebody like Wilcox angrier than the sort of absolving the, the conquistadores of blame is the idea that uh, when it comes to people who are indigenous peoples like the Maya or the Odom or the people on Easter Island, those people somehow made the choice to fail but they disappeared because of their bad ecological choices. And so again, Wilcox is saying here that this is a false critique and that somehow the conquerors end up being absolved of any blame or agency. But if you're an indigenous person building a city or a pyramid, somehow if you then Aren't, don't have a city when the Spaniards arrive, and there's still plenty of Maya people around, by the way, but somehow you're a society that chose to fail. So these are kind of uh, why somebody like Wilcox would get, uh, would get perturbed, upset by what, uh, huh? It looks like I'm gonna shut down. Upset by Thank you. this story? I'm good. We're good now. Choose to fail. So, Wilcox has some different ideas about what we should be doing or thinking about instead of these, or instead of the narrative. So, um, well, Juliana, what's one of his, his big problems with how archaeology is done? What what are the what is the problem with these archaeologists often? Well, 
What is the problem? What does Wilcock criticize the archaeologist for? I'll put in a positive spin on it. It's better. You'll get better archaeological results if you actually talk to the people who are living that area and ask them about the things that you're digging up. You do it together with people. We've talked about this in terms of the genetics. It'll be better. And so uh, Wilcox is saying the problem has been that archaeologists often in, go into places that are supposedly abandoned without talking to people who might live around there and know something about what was happening back then. They may not, but you might. You might just try it. And what he's arguing is that Although there may have been a military conquest, and we can think about military conquests in the, in, the, in the kinds of things that we've seen over the years, that societies aren't transformed or it's, that's only the, that's the best the first part of the story. You can't hold a society together simply by, by, by guns. And so what he's saying here is that the, the, I, the, the things that transform the society over the long term and resulted in uh, people being put in a subordinate position to others uh, happened through he, his ideas that the true conquest was when the lawyers showed up and a, some, put a militarized version of Christianity and the greed of people who were trying to get land and water and all kinds of resources. And so what he's saying is that it wasn't the, it wasn't some sort of ecological, ecological destiny, or it wasn't written in the cards that these societies were going to collapse. It wasn't a choice that they made. It was rather a, a political issue, a political struggle and certain people were able to win that and other people lost out. And if we want to think about, if we want to think about what kinds of agriculture are sustainable in the Southwest of the United States, and we're living out the consequences of that right now, um, heavy duty irrigation is, um, it's, it may, not, it may not be the best approach for that area. So indigenous systems may actually be more sustainable than that. So he makes an interesting statement at the end, near the end of the article. He says, assuming that Indians are still here as I am forced to do, why is he forced to assume that Indians are still here? Because they are, but why would he be forced to do that? Huh? <laughs> ah, funny. On page 100, he says, he says more explicitly who he is. Many people, educated or just curious, this author included, have spent time perhaps on a beach somewhere, wondering about the same things. What startles me into wakefulness is my own position as a fully modern Native American archaeologist. So, yes, he's forced to do that because he's like, wait a second, I'm still here. I'm here. And he said that I have now read in courses that I have taken and in those in which I teach innumerable accounts of my ancestors' collective failures. So, you know, imagine having to teach this shit. Being a person like, wait a second. I'm here. I don't need to read about how, how bad things were for my people. I'm here. And so for Wilcox, what needs to be explained is not just how people were 
people conquered and, and decimated and that happened, but how people have survived and continued to be here and have become archeologists even. 